Hey everybody, good morning, welcome back. Um, hopefully you guys are doing great. It's Monday, May the 4th, and um, we're just about to get in our you know, Monday morning uh, lecture for Intro to Philosophy, so you guys are doing really good and got some good rest over the weekend and feeling well. I'll be right with you guys about five minutes as we uh, get things underway. <clears throat> Welcome, guys. All right, guys, good to see you. See a few more showing up. Just getting my electronic notes all prepared here. Second, I just got to use my computer for a little task, so I have it kind of skewed at a different angle for a second. <clears throat>
Okay. Sorry, guys, for that little delay, but welcome back, everyone. Hi, Eric. Hi, Emily. Um, good, good. So today, basically, we just have a uh, straightforward plan. We're going to try and just wrap up the last few words to say about uh, Alan Turing's article, and then um, we're going to start in on the last subject of the semester. Hey, Hugh. Um, the last topic is... Um, <clears throat> Life and Death and the Value of Human Life, so we got a couple of important authors and essays lined up on that subject, but um, question, did any of you guys notice this morning I delivered a uh, message over the Blackboard system? If you did, just let me know. Um, just trying to confirm that you got it because that's the study guide for the final. Um, have you guys gotten it? I'll just wait to see if you can say If you haven't maybe checked, okay, good, Quinn. So awesome. You guys got it. That's the study guide. Um, we'll use that to review for the final exam, um, which is, you know, next week on Wednesday and um, Friday. We've designated our time for that. And um, if I'm looking at that study guide really quick. Yeah. So we're, uh, there's a set of questions. There's a big list of 82 questions. It's pretty much evenly distributed between the first half of the class and the second half. Good morning, everybody, and good to see everyone that's saying hi. Thanks for that. So, yeah, basically, um, we're reaching the end. Um, your guys' final paper is due next Monday, so obviously you're going to be handing that in to me, and then um, I'll grade it before the weekend so that you have all of your grades uh, finalized up till the final. And then um, the final exam, you know, you guys are just going to take it on Tuesday the 19th, so that's the date. It's uh, Tuesday, May 19th. I forget the time slot, but I can look it up on the um, syllabus. Anyway, we'll pay more attention to that as we get closer to it next week. But, um, you know, we have our work laid out for us, just another essay. And the final, obviously, with this final, the way that it's all being done now, it's, you know, you're taking it at home and you have more time to take it. It's a two and a half hour exam. The midterm, you were allotted less time to just kind of keep with the, uh, kind of in-class synchronous format, but um, since you'll have access to your notes and books and everything, um, you should be able to do pretty well as long as you take sufficient time to prepare and uh, attend the review sessions and, you know, have been reading the book and taking good notes. So at any rate, that's just uh, what I would say to you guys for this morning in terms of the class announcements. Just remember to take a look at that study guide. Um, it's, you know, it's just like our midterm in terms of format. You're going to get a set of questions given to you on the day of the final, and uh, it's going to come from that list, and then you'll have to answer a certain number of them. Um, it's not going to be too many more questions than I, than I gave you on the midterm. I think I had you ask, answer six. Um, with the additional time that you have, maybe I'll bump it up to like eight or maybe nine maximum, but uh, that's the way it'll go. So anyways, then, um, if you ever do have questions about it or anything else as we move forward the next few weeks, just let me know, and uh, I'm checking my emails every day to just make sure that I'm in touch with all the students. Um, okay then, so let's say the last few things I guess about Alan Turing. Um, <clears throat> opening to this notes in my notebook. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so back to Alan Turing quickly. Oh yes, Marissa, you said, where is its study guide? The physical location, it's hard to say. It's in the uh, it's in your inbox. Um, right now it's in your inbox. So just open your emails for Chapman and you'll find it there. Um, okay, so back to you know these notes. Um, Alan Turing wrote about whether computers, machines could ever have consciousness wherever they could think. And um, he thinks that they could have consciousness and that maybe they will in the future as long as they perform a certain level of, uh, you know, imitation towards human behavior in this Turing test. So what he thought was if we had a person who's on the other side of a uh, partition and uh, opposite on the other side of the partition, we have one human and one computer. Um, the question is, could this computer have consciousness? Well, here's how we would test it. We would get the interrogator on the reverse side of the wall to ask uh, a set of interview questions to the two individuals, one the computer, one the human. And after the interviews were both done, 
this person would try to judge uh, which one uh, that I was talking to was the human being and which one was the computer. And if we reached a point in time where the interrogator could not reliably distinguish the two cases, so basically where he's failing at a run around a 50% rate, then we should say that the computers are actually thinking things. That's the standard of consciousness that Turing sets forth. He thinks that they'll be thinking machines with consciousness when they do pass the Turing test, when they uh, cause a interrogator to give the wrong answer about who's the human around half the time. Um, okay, we talked more about just the thought that these are digital computers that uh, are discrete state machines. Those are machines that are in one definite state at a given time with the next state being a function of its prior state and an input signal. Um, he thinks that eventually in the future, yes, machines, discrete state machine digital computers will be uh, capable of passing the Turing test and then he sh we should consider them to be conscious. But of course there are objections and uh, I guess when we left on Friday I was just talking to you about some of those different objections. Um, one of them was the mathematical objection which says that um, you know, due to certain technical and computational limits there are specific questions that a given computer could never answer and since that's not true of humans maybe uh, there's, the sh there's the tell that they're not actually having real consciousness. In response to that, Turing said, uh, not so fast, there's really no distinction here if you think about it, because we humans also, uh, with the human computer brain, have got questions that we cannot possibly uh, supply answers for as well. So how much different are we? Maybe not so much different. Um, another objection was the objection from um, consciousness that no matter how well the machines play in the game, despite that, uh, they'll never actually have consciousness because they'll never be able to like feel or think uh, or experience anything. The reason they're giving these answers and stuff is not because of the actual qualitative experience of having consciousness, but just because of an input-output signal that they've been programmed to give. In reply to that, Turing said, um, well, whether any individual has consciousness is not something that you can verify from the inside point of view of being the individual having consciousness. So generally, you have to look at behavior from a third person perspective to evaluate whether any uh, being has got consciousness. And therefore, judged based on behavioral criteria, when the machines behave exactly uh, consistent to the way a human does, then why should we doubt that they have consciousness? He thinks that would just be to assume doubts that are almost like Cartesian skeptical doubts that are not realistic. Um, and then the only other one that I wanted to mention was the uh, so-called Lady Lovelace's objection. And I'm just going to talk about it because I want us to move on quickly, but you can always review in your notes or in the textbook or by replaying this uh, piece of the lecture. But Lady Lovelace was a friend of Turing's and she said, um, okay, here's my problem with your whole argument. Uh, the machines that would perform however well in these games, they're only doing what they've been programmed to do. But that's not like us. You know, humans can just do random and spontaneous creative things that don't seem to be consistent with past behavior or that are unpredictable. So wait, wouldn't that show that there's no, no real consciousness in the machine? It's just behaving based on programming instructions. But we... Uh, are unlimited in the potential to display whatever behavior. Okay, in reply to this, what's Turing's reply to that objection? Here's, here's how he comes back. He says, again, kind of similar to the response to the mathematical objection, once again, there's no real difference here uh, between humans and computers because just as well as the machines and computers, we cannot do anything that we have not been programmed to do. So for example, if a baby's born today, um, and there's a lot of babies that are going to be born today. So happy birthday to them. But can they talk right now? No. Um, well, will they maybe be talking in like 10 years? Sure, in most cases. Uh, but what's the difference between day one and then 10 years later when they're fully you know, verbal and talking and everything? Um, well, it's not something that bubbles up from within them, right? They have to receive the instruction on the language from external sources. And if they didn't receive those kind of, um, you know, teachings and input from their parents, from their environment, from their society, community, and the community of language speakers, then they would never have developed the language. So you could argue that a human mind is just like the computer in the sense that it can do all kinds of things, but only once it's been given information from some external source. 
you, for example, couldn't have talked about the Turing test probably uh, a month ago because you had not read about it yet, but now you can. And in between then and now, you've been given information from the book, from me, and uh, now you have that in your, I guess, neural network of facts that you can reflect on and discuss. But you also can only discuss and consider information that you've gotten from some external source. And therefore, as Turing would see it, we're just a much more vastly powerful and uh, extensively um, you know, deep storage base in a, a computer, but we are not in, in a qualitative difference from, uh, from, net, from the artificial computers that we make. It's just a difference of degree, but not kind. Okay, um, so that would be Turing, I guess. Now I've just sort of wrapped up whatever I thought that was important to continue to say to you guys. Now it's time to move on once again in our class to another big new subject. So uh, the new topic for us now is life and death. <clears throat> life and death and the value of human life. Um, so <clears throat> let me just get my notes set up again. Yeah, so uh, it's a deep and personal issue, life and death, right? It's, it's simply true that some of the most difficult questions that we face as human beings are questions like, um, how should we live our life? What would make our life go well? Um, what's the good life, if there's such a thing? Um, and how, how should we confront the fact of death? Is it a bad thing? Is it not so bad? What's the reason why or why not? Um, so we want to try and tackle that along with all the other questions that philosophers wrestle with. Um, and you might be surprised to know that there have been philosophers over the whole span of history that have tried to tackle this deal, um, like what makes a human life go well, and uh, what are the answers for us in terms of what we should be seeking in our lives. Because <clears throat> I know one thing is true, we're all living human lives, and um, none of us, I think, are just kind of um, apathetic about how our own life goes. I mean, some people don't have a lot of concern or care for others, unfortunately, but most everybody, I think, uh, unless you're really depressive or whatever, most people at least care about their own person, right? So you want your life to go well at a minimum, I would think. You couldn't just shrug your shoulders and be like, what, my life going well, going bad? Who cares? It's just going. It doesn't matter how it goes. So most of us want our life to go well, and therefore we're seeking out answers for ourselves at a minimum. What should we do if we want to have that happen? Um, now you might think there's no intelligent or objective facts about this, no like real answers. Maybe it's just every individual chooses their own course and there's no one size fits all method to live a good life. But um, philosophers, some have argued that there actually are uh, general patterns that lead to the best human life possible. Other people say, no, it's much more subjective and it's based on the individual. So we're gonna kind of study both sides of that and uh, see what the best ideas are. So as we begin this new subject, life and death, and again, the question, what would make a human life go well? Like your life, for example, or mine or anyone else's. Um, we're gonna start with some of the old, early writings of the ancient Greeks. So at least one time before in a class, we studied Plato when we read about um, epistemology and the theory of knowledge. So now we're getting back in touch with Plato again uh, as we close the class, and uh, he wrote an important book called The Republic. Um, in that book, he gives an account of what would make for the ideal human life. So today we're studying him on the topic of what makes a life go well. So again, Plato, classical ancient Greek philosopher. Um, <clears throat> Plato, remember, he lived from 428 until 347 BC. And um, <clears throat> he wrote this book called The Republic, um, sometimes just called Plato's Republic. From this book, and that's, kind of, that's considered Plato's um, most important contribution. The, the Plato's Republic is his like magnum opus, his epic you know, classic book. Um, so we're really just talking about today a little section from that book, which yet again, our editors from the 
textbook that we have have extracted it and retitled it. So they've called it On the Harmony of the Soul. But it's really just a piece of writing from Plato's Republic. On the Harmony of the Soul from Plato's Republic, from the ancient Greek writer Plato. And um, this, again, does offer us a perspective on what the ideal um, kind of human life would be and therefore a view on what would make a human life go well. Um, so we started with Plato. After we finish with him today and however much time it takes, the next author in the order will be um, Jean-Paul Sartre. That's a 20th century French philosopher. He has a much different perspective on this same question, what makes a human life go well. So we're gonna be obviously you know, kind of comparing different accounts, um, different arguments as we've done throughout our class. Um, <clears throat> so Plato, On the Harmony of the Soul slash Republic. Okay, so as you guys re maybe remember, in a lot of these Platonic writings, they're written in a dialogue format, which kind of almost reads like it's a play, where you have a Cartes, once again, is the main speaker, um, who is usually the main speaker in Plato's writings, because as we've said, he's the teacher of Plato, well regarded as like the classical ancient Greek kind of head honcho philosopher that started a lot of this stuff. So anyway, Socrates is talking in this dialogue with Plato's older brother, whose name is Glaucon. So it's basically Socrates and Glaucon having a little discussion, conversation, chat about what would make a human life go as well as possible. But in order for me to kind of really give you guys the uh, account here of what he said, I have to start by opening up a bigger discussion of the Republic itself. Because a lot of what Socrates says here about what makes a human life go well is modeled on an account of what makes the ideal society. So the book, The Republic, I'm now giving you like crash course in The Republic, which is needed for your comprehension of today's essay. Okay, so The Republic is Plato's attempt to try and craft um, an account of like what would be the ideal human society. So it's kind of like this vision of a utopian society, the ideal form of human social organization. So Plato thought a lot about this question, right? What would make a human society or government the best case kind of society that it could be? He thought that there would be a specific form or format that a society would take if and when it's flourishing at the highest level and being the best just society for all of its citizens. So, um, we're going to have to start, therefore, by talking about the components of the ideal republic or society. And then what you will see is that uh, Plato tries to just kind of link that idea to what would make the best human life. So there's a parallel, according to him, between the best type of human society and the best individual human life. So I'm starting off with a big social picture here of what makes the ideal society, and then we'll take that step afterwards to link this account to what makes a human life go well uh, as an individual rather than society. Okay, so um, erasing this so I can give you some no more detailed no notes now on uh, Plato's Republic Society. Okay, so the Republic, by the way, is just like the name of that ideal society. So this is like that ideal utopian society. There's a couple of other, you know, books in the history of literature and philosophy that have tried to grapple with this topic, what would be a best society. Thomas More, he wrote the book Utopia, and, uh, but, but Plato's is very, very well argued and articulate. So, okay, here's his view. He said that in the best society, the Republic, there would be three main um, parts of society or sections, if you will. So three main parts of the Republic. Okay, so three main different like functions of the society, and these would be three different uh, offices or occupations into which all the people would be placed, one of the three for each person. So one of them were the merchants. Then you have the warriors, and then the kings. Merchants, warriors, and kings, the three elements or component parts of the Republic. 
And now let me tell you about what each part does. Um, the merchants, okay, they are just the equivalent of like our modern day um, working people who just own and operate businesses and trade goods and services for a profit. So these are the people who um, make goods and services and trade those things for a profit. Merchants, okay, so that's a, the largest class within society. That's just the working people working for, um, you know, their income by, I don't know, working a trade, a craft, some type of business uh, or commerce. The merchants, a consumer product, uh, which then is your source of economic livelihood. So whether it was a person, I don't know, um, operating a car wash, a um, delivery service, um, landscaping, um, you know, anything under the sun, making clothing, making food, um, the working people. So that's the biggest part of society where I guess most of the people are placed and they have an important job to do. Their job is to make the goods and services and trade them so that the society has those goods and services and then they profit off of the sale. So that's their job. That's a big part of society. But it's not the only part, okay? So next, let's talk about those warriors. The warrior part of society is otherwise kind of similar to um, the role of police and military. Uh, so these are the security forces of the society. Their job is not to produce goods and services and trade them for a profit like a business person, but rather um, to provide for security and uh, internal stability of the society. So these are the people who protect and defend the society against external threats and internal instability. <clears throat> external threats and I'll just say internal instability. Okay, so, you know, if there was like an invading army from some other part of the world, then the warriors, like the military forces, would defend against the, the invading army. If there was, let's say, um, riots and rebellions happening that had to be suppressed, um, you know, disturbance of civil order, then like the National Guard or whatever, they could come in and uh, restore peace and order to their, to their society internally. So just basically like police, military, um, and different divisions of the armed forces. That's the warriors. So their job is to fight and defend, not to make stuff that they sell. Um, and now the third component part of society, this is really all important to kings, um, because this is the equivalent of the political leadership class. So this is like the corollary to your uh, presidents, prime ministers, literal monarchs, heads of state, um, <clears throat> if there is a representative body that is empowered to make decisions for the society, like if it's not ruled by a king, but rather like a um, house of lords or a congress, then it would be the members of that body. Uh, but at any rate, those are the leaders of the society who preside over everything and uh, make decisions about policy. Okay, so. political leaders who decide policy, and also the kings are those who um, would make decisions about when and whether to order the warriors into service for the benefit of the society. So it would be un on the orders of the king that the warriors would, let's say, attack um, or defend or go into to action of whatever kind. So the kings are you know, the ones that run everything, and their decisions are 
you know, the ultimate authority. Now, <clears throat> in this republic system, people would be placed into one of these different three categories, but uh, there are a few differences between their system and the modern um, kind of Western democratic system that we have today. Even though there are kind of very loose similarities, of course, between um, Plato's conception of the ideal society and the forms of uh, Western liberal democracy that, that you know, we enjoy living in today, there are definite similarities, but there are some differences too. So for example, in, um, in like American style, modern day democracy, um, if, you, if you want to join any different part of society, we say to you today that you're free to do that based on your own just choices and desire. So like in American society, right, you could be the biggest, strongest, physically tough person, but if you really wanted to just open a business and sell, you know, I don't know, um, cake for a living um, out of a bakery, then that's your choice, right? And so you could be like fit to be a warrior, but you just choose to be a merchant. That's something that you're permitted in our world. Or, you know, vice versa. You could be, let's say, the most intelligent, wise person who can make the best decisions as a policymaker. But if you really just want to offer your service to the military, then you're free to do that also in our world. So, you know, you could be like fit to be a king, but you just choose to be a military member or police uh, member of the police forces. But in Plato's Republic, though, it wasn't like that. It wasn't where everyone has the liberty to just choose their station in society. Instead, you would have been placed into the given part of society by a very rigorous method of evaluation and testing that starts when you're very young. So let me help you understand the way that procedure would work. Um, in Plato's Republic, basically, children and stuff would be put into the um, equivalent of our K-12 through education system where they would learn all their primary subjects as young people. So they would take course in training in like um, music, gymnastics, history, literature, arithmetic, and everything else. And then when they would get to the conclusion of that first tier of their education, they would be um, expected to take a big comprehensive examination or test. And based on the results of this post-primary education qualifying exam, they would be uh, judged. So suppose it's kind of like, I mean, you know, some of you guys probably took like the SATs and stuff when you finished high school to determine perhaps part of the determination of your placement at colleges. This would be like the SAT, but on, you know, a totally another level uh, because it would determine much more about your ultimate outcomes in life. So basically you take this big exam when you're done with your first, you know, course of study as a young person and suppose that you did really well in it, right? Okay. Well, if you did do well enough, then you would be passed along to a higher tier of higher education. Okay. So if you kind of aced your big exam after you finished your primary schooling, now you can continue to a higher level of further study. But suppose that you did not do as well as maybe you wanted on that first big exam. In that case, your education stops there and you just become a warrior. So it basically it's like that would be the judgment of society that if you were not intellectually talented enough to surpass this first hurdle, then your most, uh, you know, the best contributions and talents you'll be able to offer society will not be your intellectual abilities, but rather your physical abilities. So kind of keep that in mind. The whole process here was intended to make sure that people get placed into the part of society where their innate abilities and talents are most uh, going to equip them to thrive. So they were trying to sort of assign people to the role where they were most well suited to be excellent. And uh, therefore, they're trying to like weed people out to determine who's the highest quality. They're going to be the only ones that can go on to these higher stations in society. So back to our system. They took the first exam. Did they pass it? Okay. If so, secondary education. Did they fail it or not pass it? Okay. You're going to be basically a warrior. Now, take the case then of those that passed it. Now they're appointed to this second and more advanced course of higher education. And um, they'll pursue that for a while. And when that process is over with, now they're expected to take a second exam, which is even more advanced. Okay. So they take this secondary, more intensive examination subsequent to their secondary education, their higher education. 
And yet again, there's two possible results. So these individuals who passed the first exam and now are taking the second, they could have passed or, or failed that second one. Suppose they do pass it, they succeed. Now they get appointed to a third order course of even higher study that extends well into their adult life. But if they didn't pass that second exam, then uh, they discontinue their higher education and they be, get placed into the merchant class. So who are the merchants? They're people with some intellectual skills and talents, uh, more so than the warriors, I guess, who failed earlier. But they're still not the absolute elite, highest cream of the crop uh, intellectual talent. So they will not be able to pursue the even higher course of study that eventually leads people to become the kings. So the people who passed even that second course of education, who are now onto their tertiary education, when that concludes, then they just enter the ranks of the kings. Okay, and so in the Platonic society of the Republic, the way that it was supposed to be structured, uh, people don't just get to be kings because they are popular or because they are well-liked. In fact, Plato and Socrates, they hammer this point home over and over again that they think democracy is wrong, that it's dangerous, that it's unwise, uh, because they kept saying in these writings of the Republic that there's a danger in democracy because the people who ultimately hold power, you know, the political leadership, they're just appointed to their positions by means of voting and majority rule. But uh, Plato thought and Socrates thought that a system which gives people power based on majority rule could be corrupted, uh, that you could have a person who's able to capture a majority of the voting popula uh, population um, but be a corrupt person with no intelligence and basically run the society into the ground. So to make sure that the kings were not imbeciles or whatever, they had to be rigorously trained and tested in this intellectual way so that they could have only possibly, uh, you know, arrived at the seat of power through their, through their intellectual ability and not through, you know, the manipulation of a political uh, will to suit their favor. Okay, so it's not democracy, but it's a structured society where people are placed in different roles. Um, so that's how people get divided into the three parts of the society. Now, next thing I need to talk to you guys about is that there's, according to Plato, a virtue that each part of the Republic would exhibit when it's doing its job well and when it's working at the highest level. So I'm going to explain to you this topic of what a virtue is and then we'll talk about what virtue is associated with each of the three parts of the Republic. Okay, so <clears throat> the word virtue, as the Greeks understood it anyway. Virtue. So the word virtue refers to, in their thought, an attribute that a thing would have if it's able to do its function excellently well. Okay, so... The quality that a thing has when it is able to uh, perform its function excellently well. So that's just the definition of the term virtue. Um, let me help you understand it with a quick example. Um, so sometimes we are in the kitchen and, uh, you know, we're cooking. Sometimes in the kitchen we might need to use a kitchen knife to prepare food. Now, what's the function of, let's say, a kitchen knife? That should be easy enough. So basically, what is its job? Um, what is the task that it's there that it's created to perform? The kitchen knife. Easy enough, but let's just go over it. What is that? <clears throat> so its function is easy to say. We're talking about a kitchen knife to cut things. Yes, to cut food, right? Vegetables, meat, or whatever else that you're preparing to cook. Now, if it's going to have the ability to, to cut things at a high level and do that excellently well, then what virtue is the virtue of the knife? This is the quality that when the knife has it, it's a good knife. 
that's a high functioning knife. So basically, the virtue that's bound up with knives is to be what? What kind of knife can do its job very well? Right, sharpness. Okay, so when the knife has the quality of being sharp, it's a knife that can do its job excellently. If it's a dull knife, right, then it's not going to be able to cut it at that same high level, and it won't be able to do it as well. So what's a good knife? A sharp one. So sharpness is the virtue of knives. Okay, now, returning to the three parts of the Republic, the claim is that each part of it would also have a certain virtue if it was working at the highest level and doing its job excellently well. So I'm going to talk to you now about the virtue of each of the three parts of Republic. So first of all, the virtue of the merchant class. So the merchants, what's their job? Their job is to produce goods and services to trade for some type of profit. Um, well, the virtue that Plato thinks would make these good merchants that are doing the job excellently is a virtue which is called temperance. So let me put this here and explain. Their virtue is temperance. Okay, so what is temperance? It's a word which refers to moderation and self-control, restraint, over your appetites and desires. Temperance, moderation and self-control over your desires. Basically not getting too carried away with the things that you want and the things that you desire to have. Not getting too greedy or too desirous of the increase of wealth. So the merchants do make money and they profit off of the trade and sale of the goods and services that they produce. But the thing is, they have to have a little bit of self-control in that. So they're not supposed to become so greedy that they allow their desire for wealth and profit to corrupt the quality of their goods and services or to result in financial corruption, like basically ripping people off or doing bad deals. So the merchants can do a great thing for society, producing goods and services that everyone wants, that everyone needs uh, in order to optimize our living. But um, they would corrupt the society and they would undermine it if they did not have temperance because they would basically become so greedy that they would inflate the price of goods and they would reduce the quality of the goods, seeing only to their profits and not to the well-being of the consumer or the society that they are producing the goods for. So merchants that are doing their job well just have to have a little, or I don't know, moderate dose of self-control and moderation. You know, it's good to make money, it's good to profit, but not to such an extent that you actually become tempted by the temptation of corruption, fraud, or abuse. So what's a good merchant? A temperate merchant. A merchant that's making goods and services, profiting, but within a realistic profit margin that neither uh, undermines the quality of the goods themselves or imposes burdensome costs on the consumer that cannot be justified. There you go. So that's one important quality. When merchants do have temperance, though, they do their job well and they do it in a way that benefits the society that they're a part of. So merchants should have the quality of temperance. Next up, we've got these warriors. So what's their job? Their job is not to produce goods and services which are traded for profit. They have a whole different job, and their job is, as we said, to provide for the security um, and defense of the society. So if they're going to be good warriors that can capably provide that protection and security, then they have to have the quality which is called uh, courage, sometimes bravery. But we'll just use courage. So that's the virtue which is distinctive of warriors, to have courage. And um, courage is just the willingness to face danger um, in order to do what is right and necessary. So Okay.
Okay, so if you're courageous, if you have courage, then you're not so cowardly and afraid that you shrink from a dangerous situation where you're called on to act. And obviously, you know, it's not a very good soldier or police officer who sees a scary situation where they could get harmed and says, you know what, that's too dangerous and I don't think I need to get involved in that. Obviously, their whole job is to protect and to provide and to be willing to take some kind of risks of their own safety in the discharge of their duties. So um, you don't want to have military forces out there that are going to run away from the battle. You don't want to have police, uh, National Guard units or whatever that are going to be overwhelmed by the fear of a dangerous or risky situation. So warriors should have courage, otherwise they couldn't be very good warriors, right? There's that virtue that is associated with them. And then third, the kings, right? The all important kings who set policy, who create the laws and uh, rules that everyone has to abide by in the, in the society, the Republic. For them to be good kings that can make sound judgments and uh, use the proper kind of forward thinking and uh, foresight, then they have to simply have wisdom. And so that's the virtue of the kings, to be wise, wisdom. Um, wisdom is just the ability to make good decisions and to exercise good judgment. So good judgment and long range planning. And I mean, there's more that I could say that's kind of synonymous with the concept of wisdom. It's basically it's just being intelligent, right? Being smart, being able to, uh, you know, rationally consider all the reasonable basis for a policy or an action of the Republic, and then to make the right decision. So if you had kings in charge of the whole society in the highest position of power, but they were not wise, if they were, you know, idiotic, imbecilic, um, intellectually unfit, then they would undermine the Republic from within by steering it towards decisions that are not in its own best interests and they're not likely to lead to its prosperity. So clearly when you give people the ultimate power, they should be smart and wise. Um, that's what Plato thought. So if the three parts of the Republic then trained according to this long course of rigorous uh, education and testing, uh, if each of the three parts of the Republic exhibited the virtue which is distinctive of their part, and they did their own job and did not try to step outside of their lane and do the job of other parts of the society, then that would be one Republic which is harmonious, balanced, and functioning at the highest level. So that's what he thought would create a just society, a society in which all members would thrive and uh, a society in which you would want to live because it's functioning well. So you've got temperate merchants, courageous warriors, wise kings, all of them placed in their station according to their actual capacities and abilities, working harmoniously, cooperatively together, exhibiting the virtue of their class. Um, not doing the job of another part. So basically, the kings are the wise rulers, but they shouldn't, let's say, try to micromanage the decisions of the warriors. If you had kings on the battlefield, they would start debating the philosophical merits of the next move. Um, so they're well equipped to be kings, but perhaps not the decisive, brave fighting forces that would be the warriors. Likewise, the warriors have a job to fight and defend and provide security but they don't have the intellectual acumen or ability to be the kings. So if there was like a military coup where the warrior class overthrew the kings and then started to exert authority in the society, that society would also be ruined because the warriors are not intellectually capable to make decisions like kings are. So they would occupy power, but without the wisdom needed to do it correctly. Merchants, right? They make goods and services for profit, but let's say that their uh, sphere of influence became too large and they started to influence the policy making decisions of kings towards their benefit and away from the benefit of the whole society or republic that could also undermine and corrupt its functioning so they should each do their job but stay in their own lanes basically the merchants shouldn't be trying to act like kings the kings shouldn't be trying to act like warriors warriors shouldn't be trying to act like merchants etc 
Um, now, the next step in this whole presentation of Plato's Republic is that I have to talk to you about how the three parts of society are now going to be claimed to stand as kind of representative of three parts of the human soul. So what Plato believed is that the individual soul, like me and you, our individual person, is a microcosm of the Republic. That within our soul, which he believed we do have a soul, there are also three big parts. And the three parts of the human soul are correlative to the three parts of the Republic. So there's one part of the soul for each part of the Republic, and they're kind of similar in terms of what they do. So we'll have to talk more about that on Wednesday to catch up a bit, but basically I'll just give you a little preview. Um, the merchant part of the Republic, the, corral, the corollary to that in the human soul is um, that there's an appetitive part of you. The appetitive part of your soul is the part that has desires and that wants those desires to be satisfied. So when you feel like I want something, I need something, I gotta get it, that's the appetitive part of you that's active in that time. And it's kind of like the merchants because the merchants want to make a profit. So they represent desire for an increase in, you know, your current situation. The warriors <clears throat> signify or are represented by a part of your soul, which is called the spirited part of your soul. So that's the part of your soul that's competitive, that is very prideful, that likes to win, hates to lose, never wants to be disrespected, that likes to exhibit skill. And, um, you know, so that's the second part of your soul. It's the part of you that feels like a sense of pride and honor that would be offended if you or someone you cared about were slighted. Um, it's the part of you that would be, let's say, active in a sport, for example, where you're really competing to win. So that's another part of your soul, the, uh, the um, spirited part, which is kind of like the warriors because they have the fighting spirit to defend the society. And they do it with zeal and all that. And then the third part of your soul, which is similar to the king's, it's called the rational part of your soul. That's basically the smart part of you, the part that is um, capable of setting emotion aside and just making sound intellectual decisions, um, uninfluenced by passion or, um, or greed or desire. So the rational part of you is kind of like the king's because it's the part that should run the whole show and that it should lead. So just like in the case of the Republic, the Republic functions at its highest level when each part of the society is doing its job for the benefit of the whole according to its virtue. And in terms of your individual soul, the same claim is made, that you're going to live the best human life when the three parts of your soul work according to their virtue and they harmoniously cooperate under the proper leadership of your reason. So just like these wise kings should be the highest authorities in the Republic, the rational intellect within you should be the part that's running your life and not allowing it to be, let's say, commandeered by the lower parts of your soul, which have important jobs to do, but which are not fit to make judgments or to um, govern over your actions. Um, last thing I'll say before we leave today, and we're going to wrap this up on Wednesday, is that uh, an interesting aspect of Plato's writings in the Republic and elsewhere is that he says of these kings, these ideal leaders, that they would be philosophers in the perfect world. Um, so Plato talks about the, the leadership class as the philosopher kings. So that's kind of interesting, right? Because if Plato's ideal society existed, then it would be people like me, actually, that would be the, uh, the rulers over society. Why? Because I guess philosophers, by nature of their um, subject area, are wise and reasonable people, and that's supposed to be the number one quality that justifies your position as a king, not that you're charismatic or that you're popular or funny or that, you know, you say what people really think and that you get people, but just that you're rational and wise. Um, so I don't know if I necessarily agree with that based on some of the philosophers that I've met, but uh, uh, maybe for me, it'd be fine, you know, because I'm pretty cool. But anyway, good to see you guys again. And um, I'll be back with you on Wednesday. Make sure that you've taken a look at the study guide over the next few days and as we get closer to your essay due date next Monday, you know, you can always ask me any questions you have about it too. But we'll finish up this Plato discussion Wednesday, and then we have a little bit more on the question of what makes a human life go well, and we can compare a couple of authors' ideas once we get down to it. So, uh, yes, Marissa, feel free to send me any draft if you have it. As long as it comes to me, hopefully not too late in the weekend, I could get people comments uh, if they would like, you know. So maybe if I receive things by Friday or so, 
that would give me ample time to reply within another 24 hours or something. Okay, well, take it easy, guys, and have a good one. Glad your week's off to a good start, and I'll see you back on Wednesday then. Bye-bye.